Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do a companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net if you have suggestions for topics guests and other ideas please send them to info@scientificsense.com and i can be reached at gil at epen.info My guest today is Professor Howard Fields, who is Professor Emeritus of Neurology at UCSF. He was a founder of the UCSF Pain Management Center and has made major contributions to understanding and treating neuropathic pain. Welcome, Howard. Good afternoon. Yeah, so thanks for doing this. So I, I want to start with, I know that you are, you are uh, a well-known, one of the world's experts on pain. Um, I want to start one of your older papers from 2006 entitled, A Motivation Decision Model of Pain, the Role of Opioids. Um, you say pain is a sensation like touch, vision, and olfaction, and it is defined by its subjective properties. Um, Although activation of primary afferent uh, nociceptors initiates a variety of responses, it is a relation of the nauseous stimulus to the psychophysical properties of the subjective experience that has attracted the attention of most researchers. Um, Howard, I used to think that pain is pretty simple. Uh, Some uh, electrical (laughs) impulses travel up the nerves into the brain and that you uh, you feel pain. There is something more to it? Oh, there's a lot more to it. Uh, <laughs> it, I, it is relatively simple compared to, for example, uh, vision or olfaction. Uh, it, we know the detectors in the periphery, we call them nociceptors, uh, which means that they detect actual or impending tissue damage. We know how the message, the information is transmitted. It's just like every other uh, cell in the nervous system through action potentials that are conducted from the tissue that's been threatened or damaged to the central nervous system. We know the pathways, we know the neurotransmitters, we know the cortical areas that are activated by that stimulus. We've even got information now from functional imaging, functional magnetic resonance imaging in awake human beings where we can correlate cerebral blood flow with reports of pain. And this has given us an understanding of where uh, in the cortex you need neural activity to produce the sensation of pain. So this has been a tremendous set of experiments over the last 30 years or so to get all this information. But there is still at the end a very mysterious process that we don't understand at all. In fact, I would say it's one of the sort of major difficult problems in neuroscience, sensory neuroscience in general, which is how do you convert the electrochemical pulses in the neurons that they use to communicate with other neurons? How does that activity translate into a subjective experience. That's completely mysterious. 
and and that subjective experience is is different for different people that makes it more complicated right well i don't know if i agree with that uh oh. it's it's hard to know what somebody else's subjective experience is so it would be yeah. difficult to compare it in different people that said what i do agree with is if you apply a given painful stimulus to different people, they will report different levels of pain and perhaps different qualities of, of pain. So it's true that there's a highly variable relationship between the tissue damaging stimulus and what different people report. That's for sure true. Maybe that's what you were driving at. Yeah, that's what I was driving at. So I remember this was a long time ago when I was at Pfizer, um, company was developing some pain medications. And, and obviously one of the difficulties in clinical trials in pain is to get a consistent responses, a consistent set of responses uh, from, uh, from the patients. That's correct. And uh, there's always been the measurement problem has always been a difficult one, right? Well, it, you, can, you can constrain uh, the situation uh, in individuals, and they can be trained to give very reliable reports. And if you're using a thermal stimulus, so you can accurately control the temperature, there's a fairly reproducible relationship between the intensity of the stimulus and the numerical rating scale. So that the, you would use something like a, a zero to 10 scale, where zero is no pain, 10 is the worst pain you've ever seen. If you're around yeah. 40, uh, 43, 44 degrees, most people say, yes, that's moderately painful. I'd give that a five. As you go up, they will rate it higher and higher. However, you know, in the real world, it's very variable. You can never predict, you know, what somebody's going to tell you, say, after they've, you know, like sprained their ankle or even uh, broken a bone, uh, uh, that in the clinical situation, it is incredibly variable. Yeah. Uh, so I want to go back to the mechanism. Uh, and so uh, you hit your leg against something, uh, some sort of tissue damage happens on site. And uh, from that site, uh, some information is sent to the brain, right? That, that is the mechanism by which the brain knows something bad has Correct. happened. And at that point, uh, the brain is converting that information into some, um, what exactly happens in the brain? <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, I, you know, we know, we know the physics uh, and chemistry of it. We know how nerve cells work. We even know how they talk to each other, right? So every nerve cell pretty much is the same in the sense that it has what we call an action potential. An action potential is a rapid, in other words, anywhere from, you know, a, a half a millisecond to two or three milliseconds. You have an inward rush of sodium and you have uh, then an outward rush of potassium. Uh, yeah. So you have a depolarization and a repolarization. We call that uh, the action potential, and that's the same in all neurons. And so at then that action potential is conducted down the axon uh, to what we call the axon terminals, and it depolarizes the terminals, and those terminals release a chemical signal, which goes across a gap called the synapse, and then acts on the next cell. It could be either an excitatory or an inhibitory effect. So what you have with a painful stimulus is you evoke a pattern of excitations and inhibitions in a set of interconnected neurons. And when that set of interconnected neurons fires in a certain way, you get the perception of pain. That's how it happens. Now, as I said before, how that gets converted from the objective chemical changes that we can measure to the subjective experience of pain, that's a complete mystery. So I can't tell you, I can tell you what you need to make it happen, but I can't tell you how it happens. 
<laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, intuitively, you know, th this should have had survival benefits. Um, yes, too. This is, yes. It's sort of helping uh, Homo sapiens survive, so to speak, right? The pain, the pain process. Do we know um, of any biological systems, any animals who don't feel pain? Yes. Well, it, it, this is a really great question, Gil. Can I call you Gil? <laughs> Yes, okay, uh, so it turns out that um, there are animals that don't have nerves, uh, uh, sponges that hold phylum. Uh, they are animals, uh, but they don't have nerves. And if you don't have nerves, then you can't feel pain, right? Uh, right. The most primitive uh, animals that have a nervous system are in the phylum uh, Nidarian and uh, yeah. those uh, like sea anemones are Nidarians. Uh, they have they don't have a brain, but they have a nerve net, and they can do two things. Uh, they can rapidly respond to threats by escaping, or they can rapidly respond to a food source by moving toward it. So those are the two yeah. things that it can do. And, and that illustrates a general principle. You can ask yourself, well, what is the nervous system for? How does it help animals to have a nervous system? It helps them by allowing them to change rapidly and move rapidly in response to rapid changes in the environment that either threaten their survival or are necessary for their survival. So animals need you know, a, a source of food to survive. All animals, that's almost the definition of an animal. Plants don't need a source of food. They, they can make their own food from minerals and sunlight. But animals need to find food and having a nervous system helps them move quickly to acquire it. And if there's a threat of damage or of destruction, a predator, for example, they need to rapidly escape and respond to that in one way or another. So in order for your sensory systems to help you survive, you have to have a behavioral repertoire that allows you to react in a meaningful way to the particular stimulus, the particular change in your environment. And so, so the, the nervous system um, formed, uh, as you say, um, for either to counteract a threat or to get some sort of reward like food. Correct. Uh, and, and it is, is it, is it sort of instinctual? So when we touch something hot, uh, when we pull the hand out, um, the, is the brain doing it consciously or is it something instinctually? It's something, it's a different process. Altogether. Yes, I would say that uh, what we, if it's what we call a reflex, a reflex yeah. is a motor response that's triggered automatically by a particular sensory input. So you don't yeah. need to be awake to pull your hand away from a, a hot, say, pan. You don't need to be conscious of it. In fact, probably most people have had the experience of touching something hot, pulling their hand away, and then only after they pulled their hand away, you know, feeling the burn. So I think if mm. you have to wait till you actually have the subjective experience to react to it, it would be too slow to protect, you know, your hand from a burn. You have to be able to do it quickly. The information doesn't so some, need to, even need to get to your brain. It just needs to get to your spinal cord. Yeah, so that's what I was going to ask. So somebody in a coma would do that too? Yes. It, yes. Uh, most people in a coma will respond to pain. Uh, in a, you can be at least slightly anesthetized and still have a pain response. When an anesthesiologist is trying to gauge your depth of anesthesia, what they do is they, you know, raise the concentration of the anesthetic to the point where you just stop responding to pain. Mm. 
Um, so, so, so you you talked about the circuit that gets information to the brain. There is, um, I think, there is something else that sort of inhibits that. So that's that's a very important point. Uh, that it, it's in the the paper that we're talking about the motivation decision model. Yeah. So it turns out that the uh, stimulus. Uh, let's say a noxious stimulus that would generally provoke the sensation of pain. It's, you have to remember that it isn't just a neutral stimulus, like say, look, seeing an apple or, or smelling, you know, an apple pie. This is a stimulus that carries with it the prediction that if you don't respond to it, you're going to damn it. You're going to suffer some damage. There's going to be a cost to you. So the thing that is important to remember about painful stimuli in particular is they're not just about what's happening. They're a prediction about what's going to happen, right? What's happening is, you know, you're near a red hot, you know, iron. The prediction is that if you touch it, uh, you're going to get a burn, you're going to get tissue damage, and that's not going to be good, right? So uh, knowing that, uh, you want to get, you want to escape as quickly as possible, and you activate your motor system. In addition, uh, because it's predictive, there's a what we call a top-down modulatory uh, pathway, we call it the pain modulating system. And this runs from the cortex through the brainstem back down to the spinal cord. And it controls the volume on the pain intensity scale. The point of that you know, is that, you know, generally there's going to be a time course for the pain intensity. And this is a really important point. So I'm going to go over it slowly. If the pain yeah. If let's use a temperature because it's the simplest to understand. If you put your hand on something and the temperature is rising, the prediction is going to be if you leave your hand there over the next second or two, it's going to get worse. So you want to pull your hand away. But let's say that it's mildly painful, but instead of the temperature rising, it's falling, right? At that point, you think, oh, well, I don't need to worry, the temperature is going down, so it, I don't need to respond to it. Now we have evidence that this top-down system can control sensation bidirectionally. If the stimulus hmm. intensity is rising, it amplifies the signal, so it feels worse at any given temperature than it would if it was a steady state temperature stimulus. On the other hand, if the temperature is falling at any given temperature, it's felt as less intense than a steady temperature. So, uh, we, and we have evidence from uh, functional imaging in people that this rising, this falling temperature engages this top-down inhibitory system. It can also engage a top-down excitatory system. The top-down system is bidirectional. One group of cells amplifies the pain. We call those on cells. There's another group of cells in the brainstem uh, that inhibit pain, and we call those off cells. The off cells are activated by analgesic medications like morphine. They can be activated by endogenous opioids, we call endorphins, and they can produce actual pain relief by suppressing the pain transmission pathway and suppressing it at multiple levels, including at the earliest entry to the, to the nervous system, which is at the spinal cord. This is, this is so fascinating, Howard. You know, I, I sometimes, when I think about these things, I think about computers. Exactly. And, uh, you know, it seems like a packet of information is sent uh, because it's, it's pretty, uh, yeah, pretty important that information arrives. And uh, and then you have to follow up with that package of information. In this case, sort of a slope, 
uh, if it's temperature, sort of the, the, the slope of how the temperature yes. is changing uh, so that you can do some processing <laughs> and, uh, and give some sort of a threat, uh, threat level gauge, so to speak, right? So that uh, the body can exactly. react appropriately. Yes, and I, I would say that there, there are some formal similarities between the operation of the nervous system and the operation of a computer. Uh, I think the most important one is that the, the brain operates by moving information around. It operates symbolically. You know, it, it yeah. a particular set of connections, a particular set of timings for impulses, a particular amount of chemical released at the terminals is what creates the sensation. That's how it works, right? But if the connections are not correct, it's all nonsense. The brain doesn't work. You have to have the right connections and you have to have the right temporal pattern of ons you know, and offs, right? And uh, yeah. the brain's a little bit different from most uh, modern computers in that it has series connections between information that's represented digitally and re information that's represented in an analog fashion. So the digital representation yeah. are the action potentials. The key thing there is the interval between successive action potentials. That's where the information is carried. But at the synapse, it's, it's analog in that you can have a lot of small inputs. They're all added if they're excitatory or inhibited, if they're inhibitory at the surface of the second order cell. So it's sort of, it, I would say your brain is an analog digital computer hybrid. Hmm. And so, uh, so this gives us a, as, as a way to control pain. So this inhibiting channel, if you can, if you can influence and affect that, you can reduce pain. Exactly. Well, I don't, I don't, no, if I'd use the word artificial, it's a, it's a natural <laughs> yeah. biological system. Yeah, I mean, you know, so, sort of some external agents uh, going in, in those uh, in Well, those the, channels. External, the external agent is the information that the nervous system uses to process, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I meant, uh, so So let me ask you though. Uh, so the, the pain inhibition that happens, uh, do we have chemical agents that could, that could more? Yeah, we do. That? Um, those are the uh, opioid analgesics, right? So yeah. Percodan, Vicodin, uh, morphine, all of these are, are clinically used analgesics that work on the system and they increase the activity of the off cell. They also have direct effects on the spinal cord. So you can put morphine directly on the spinal cord to get an analgesic effect that's local uh, to the area where you put the morphine on, right? So the morphine acts at the same biological target. It's what we call the mu opioid receptor um, and yeah. these morphine, if you give it say intravenously, it will get into the nervous system. It will find those receptors and it will bind to them. Normally it's endogenous opioids like enkephalin or beta endorphin that act at those receptors. Uh, so when you give somebody morphine, you're mimicking the effect of the natural, what we call the endogenous opioid. You have another paper, state-dependent opioid yes. control of pain. Um, so you say that the mu opioid receptor are powerful analgesics and are highly addictive. However, the contribution of the opioid and opioid receptor-like receptors to motivational states is less clear. Um, so, so, so how, how does motivation come into the equation? Well, as we know, a pain itself is a motivation, right? So, and the motivation yeah. is I need to protect myself. I need to protect my tissues. Um, there can be conflicting motivations. So for example, 
you may be in a situation where you're hungry, but your back hurts. You know, if you weren't hungry, you just stay in bed and rest, but you are hungry, you're very hungry, and you feel like you have to get up and get something to eat. So there are situations in which pain, let's call that motivation A, is competing uh, with a different motivation, let's call that hunger motivation B. So how does the brain decide whether to, you know, go for the food and ignore the pain or respond to the pain even though you're hungry? So this is sort of uh, the basic conundrum that the brain has to deal with. And there are going to be a lot of variables uh, that enter into that equation. You're computing the cost-benefit relationship of a variety of things that you could do and keep it simple by just talking about food. So this is a different part of the nervous system. Uh, there are places, in, you know, in, yeah. in the forebrain, it's usually subcortical areas. Again, these areas have the mu opioid receptor. And if you, in animal experiments, if you inject a mu opioid agonist, let's say like morphine, and you activate the mu receptor in these sites, you can shift the animal's bias toward responding to food and at the same time get an analgesic effect, right? So if it, the decision that you make based on your cost-benefit computation is, I'm really hungry right now, this food tastes really good, I'm just going to go ahead and eat, you get an analgesic effect, right? So there's an analgesic effect of food. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting is that it seems like this, this same neural mechanism is involved in promoting alcohol consumption. So alcohol uh, is present in, in most ripe fruit. Uh, so a lot of uh, primates that are primarily fruit eating have a certain amount of alcohol in their diet. The alcohol indicates that the fruit is uh, ripe, ready to eat, and is energy intense, which is what animals like. So if it looks like when you start to nibble away at some fruit and it's got a little alcohol in it, you get the release of an endogenous opioid in these sites of the brain that are involved in decision-making, and that makes you drink more alcohol or eat more of an energy intense food, right? So uh, again, all of these uh, behaviors that we talk about, analgesia, we talk about addiction, we talk about alcoholism, but they're all manifestations of innate biological, you know, motivational states. Yeah. And so the cost benefit calculation the brain is making in many experiments hold the one complication is that when you when you image the brain, you see activity in a lot of different sites That's in correct. the brain. Uh, is, is that yes. the case for pain? Very too? much so. Yeah, there's widespread and activity. Uh, there's been some very nice uh, uh, what they call meta-analyses, where they've taken, I would say, hundreds or thousands of scans. And if you do enough of them and you have good psychophysical, psychophysical data, so you're asking people, yeah. you know, what is the intensity of the pain you feel? And you're gradually changing the stimulus intensity to match it across different people you can pick out what they call the neurological pain signature. Uh, th that isn't anything I've written about, but it's uh, you can Google it if you're interested. Uh, there are yeah. specific, relatively limited areas that show a very tight correlation with pain intensity. There are other areas that show activity, but they're not specifically highly correlated with stimulus intensity. One of the interesting findings, which, which I really like, but which is a bit of a head scratcher, is that there's a slightly different distribution 
of the sites in the brain that correlate with stimulus intensity. And then there's a slightly different set of sites that correlate with people's subjective report, right? So there's not an overlap mm -hmm. of the areas act you know, they're activated by the stimulus and the areas that are activated by the pain report. And that makes sense, you know, thinking about what I just said, mm -hmm. in that it's not simply pain is more than a sensation, right? It's it's a motivational state. Yeah. And what you report in terms of intensity is going to depend on the history of the stimulus, not just the intensity at the time of your pain rating, right? So there's inherent uh, nonlinearities in the system. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was also thinking about this decision-making yes. process you, you talk about. So if you know uh, if different parts of the brain is involved i i you know i wonder is some sort of a voting mechanism in place you know somebody somebody has to make a decision uh, you, you know if three four places in the brain you have data you do, do some analysis and as you say the intensity uh, uh, report uh, so, some of it is objective intensity is measured somewhere the subjective valuation is done elsewhere it, there has to be some sort of a voting mechanism ultimately to say, pull the hand off sure. right now. And that right? is, that's uh, what I would say that's inherent uh, in the wiring. And, and in addition, you need to have a place in the brain where you have what I would call a kind of currency, you know, where you can, you know, use the same currency to weigh the cost of tissue damage against the value of eating a certain amount of food, right? Well, the nice thing about the nervous system is everything is translated into neural activity, right? So you don't really have a big engineering problem. You don't have to deal with, you know, changing uh, the modality. Everything is in neural activity. So that solves the biggest problem right there, right? So then you could ask the question, are there places in the brain where you see neurons that respond in one direction to costs and in another direction to benefits? And there's a couple of places in the brain uh, that do that. So you'll have a convergence of the inputs that are say, computing the value of, of a reward. You'll have another set of neurons that are computing the cost of a painful stimulus in terms of potential tissue damage, and they converge, you know, onto a single neuron that say excited by reward and inhibited by pain. So that would be, there's some evidence that a set of neurons in the midbrain, an area called the ventral tegmental area, which has dopamine neurons. You, you may have heard of dopamine, uh, it's considered by yeah. many to be a critical neurotransmitter for encoding uh, reinforcement or reward. And um, there's, um, so these same neurons that are excited by reward are inhibited yeah. uh, by uh, painful inputs. Right. But but the cost benefit, um, you know, sort of decision is still pretty complex. Right. So going back to the, the heat uh, uh, example, uh, there is sort of a, a short term cost. And then if, if you're contrasting that with the requirement of food, there is long term cost. And, and both of these are sort of dependent on the state um, right. of the individual. Right. If the individual is for a and, you know, close to death without food, that's a different, different decision. So I just wondered, even though uh, there is a common currency there in terms of neural activity, it is still a very, very complex trade-off decision the brain has to make. Yeah, I have to think about that. Um, what I would say is that it's, it, it's, a, it, it's an equation with multiple variables, you know, and so by that definition, you could use the word complex, but, you know, there, there are things that are really complicated, 
So for example, you know, let's talk about dreaming or imagining or writing poetry or composing music. Uh, those are things, you know, to a certain extent we do not understand at all. And they certainly don't make a whole lot of sense in terms of either a cost or a benefit, right? Whereas food, you know, uh, you could you can do calculations about what uh, number of calories you need to sustain your body weight. And you can, you know, do calculations on how much damage a stimulus of a given temperature can produce. And that's something that I would think over the course of, you know, 400 million years of evolution of the nervous system, the brain's gotten pretty good at. Uh, yeah. The other thing is that we know that the hypothalamus, uh, which is in the diencephalon, it's not far from this reward site, and it's highly connected to the reward site, has neurons in it that are sensitive to food deprivation, uh, to osmolarity uh, in terms of calculating thirst, uh, you know, oxygen yeah. uh, concentration in the blood, uh, salt concentration in the blood. So there's a, a set of monitors uh, in your hypothalamus that can detect deviations from homeostasis. Homeostasis would be the ideal environment for the cells of your body. Now, I feel like those things are actually yeah. fairly well understood um, and, uh, and to a certain extent, they're, they're, they're kind of straightforward in the sense of, you know, what's ideal for the cells yeah. and all you have to do is detect perturbations from the ideal state. And then all of a sudden you've got a motivation yeah. and this motivation can be encoded in action potentials and sent to the appropriate place to say, okay, you know, there's water and you really need water if you're gonna survive for another day or two, right? When people's thirst mechanisms go off, uh, it's it's life-threatening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, you know, I, I can see some parallels to uh, artificial, you know, as the thing about computers and AI, for example, um, so the brain has set of, it sounds to me at least, uh, Howard, I don't know much about this. Uh, it has a set of experience-based heuristics. And, and because they are in heuristics form, it can just implement it uh, pretty easily, pretty quickly. Um, if, if, if it is true, then you can see it's not doing really well if you take the individual to a, a completely foreign environment. Right. It, it, yes, that it, is know, absolutely the, the true. That's correct. Is here. Yeah, I agree with that 100 percent. Yeah. So so I think that is, you know, uh, in some sense, uh, yes. that's what we're trying to do in AI, too, that you can actually because heuristics can be done or implemented, you know, pretty costlessly. Um, that is what you want to do. We'll take a quick break, uh, Howard. When we come back, okay. uh, we'll talk about your recent paper. Sounds good. Patients influence pain. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com. So we're back, uh, Howard. We were talking about pain, how the, how the brain recognizes it, uh, acts um, related to the stimulus that it's receiving from other parts of the body that might require some action. And, uh, and it's a complex uh, phenomenon. You have done a lot of work in this area, but it gets even more complicated. Uh, you have a paper in 2018 uh, entitled How Expectations Influence Pain. Uh, you said actions of individuals are guided by the motivation to satisfy drives, and these drives through actions provides a benefit in terms of survival and reproductive success. 
Uh, but more importantly, the, it is really the ex ante expectation that, that sort of sets the foundation as to how the brain recognizes how much pain there is for something. Mm-hmm. So how does it work? I mean, the, the brain has some sort of a prediction. Is that what's happening? Yes. So there's, we talked, we talked before in the earlier segment about how there's an intrinsic predictive nature to any kind of painful stimulus. It's predictive of tissue damage. And the time course, you know, will be predictive of how much damage there's going to be. If it seems like the stimulus intensity is going up, it's more frightening. And we said that it turns on an amplification system. If the stimulus intensity is falling, it's predictive of pain relief. And there's a top-down inhibition of pain because there's really less of a drive, less of a motivation to respond. Now, in addition to the intrinsic properties of the painful stimulus itself, over time, uh, we come to associate environmental cues. Let's say, you know, a a doctor's white coat, with a a needle in a syringe uh, causing pain, or we come to associate a bottle of of pain pills with relief of a headache, let's say a couple of aspirin with relief of a headache. So these cues are neutral, right? But they predict that they'll either be a painful experience or there will be a pain relief, right? So these neutral cues come to acquire a predictive quality. And it turns out that that predictive quality through these same top-down pain modulatory systems can either relieve pain or enhance pain. So we call the pain relief due to expectation. That's what we call a placebo response. So almost yeah. everybody has heard of, well, you take a sugar pill and because you think it's going to relieve your pain, it actually relieves your pain. But it hasn't really relieved your pain. Well, the fact is, yes, it actually has relieved your pain. And there's evidence that it has relieved your pain through the same circuit that's activated by morphine, this top-down pain inhibitory system. And this was something you know, back in the 70s that John Levine and I looked into the endogenous opioids, endorphins were discovered in 1975. And we were working in the lab at that time. And we said, well, let's see if there's something going on here, you know, in people. And it turned out that we could block the placebo analgesic effect with naloxone. Naloxone is a drug that blocks the the mu opioid receptor, which is the target of morphine, which is the target of endogenous opioids that act to reduce pain when pain relief is predicted. So it looked like, you know, that it was a similar pathway for a drug-induced effect and for an expectation-induced effect, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, how we came to understand how expectations can actually change what you feel at any given level of tissue damage. And that turns out to be very important. In fact, uh, there was a recent study that I refer to in this 2018 paper out of Canada where they looked at over 2,000 patients with chronic pain who were entering into a multidisciplinary pain treatment program. Uh, And then they were followed up for six months and they were looking for, you know, what is it about these patients that predicted whether they were, would respond well to whatever the treatment was that was given. And the amazing thing that they found in the study was the best predictor of whether a treatment for chronic pain was effective was whether the patients expected that the treatment would be beneficial when they entered the study. 
right? So this isn't just, you know, a cute little, you know, psychological phenomenon. This is something that has big, big clinical implications and it's critical to understand it. And I think we are beginning to have some kind of understanding of this. Yeah, it it, uh, it puts the, the the placebo effect in a slightly different context, right? So when, when we think about clinical trials, we have this control group, we have the treatment group, and, and we try to look at the difference between the two. Uh, but if you are saying that the placebo has a systemic effect, it actually creates uh, effects that are very analogous to uh, a drug-induced effect, um, then, um, then you know how you conduct clinical trials may may need to be rethought, perhaps. Absolutely, and people are giving this a lot of thought. I think you put your finger on an absolute, an absolutely critical concept, and. You know, failure to understand this has led to the failure of clinical trials in the past. So obviously, one of the things you want to do when you're analyzing your data is you can't just divide the patients into those receiving the active drug and those receiving the placebo. You actually have to go into divide them up into four groups. This is this is sort of the critical insight. Uh, and of the people who get the placebo, they're going to be divided into those who think they got the placebo and those who think they got the active drug, right? Yeah. And, the, and those who got the active drug are going to be divided into a group that thinks they got the placebo and <laughs> thinks they got the active drug. So yeah. what you have to do is, when you're analyzing your data, match the patients for similar expectations and then analyze the data that way, right? Instead of the typical way, which is you throw, you know, all these variable expectations into one group and into another group. Because if you think about it, you know, the people that who got the placebo, but think they got the active drug, they're going to have an enhanced effect from the placebo. The people that got the active drug and thought they got the placebo are going to have a less effective, you know, analgesic response, right? So right. the very nature of clinical trials is going to minimize the actual clinical effect of any drug, right? So you're, you're almost shooting yourself in the foot with a traditional design for pain studies. And, and I, yeah. I've tried to explain this to, you know, my friends in the pharmaceutical <laughs> industry, and I just get a blank stare. This is this is so fascinating, Howard. So let me see if I if I understand this. So it's a two by two matrix. Uh, on the x axis you have the placebo arm. On the y axis you have the treatment arm. And on the x axis you have two buckets. Uh, one is expected drug. Uh, the other is expected placebo. And you have the same on the y. Exactly. So exactly. you have exactly. Four Four cohorts of people, right? Four cohorts. Exactly. Of That's what I'm saying. And and you want to compare. Let me let me see if I can understand this, Robert. So you want to compare. So the the real effect, uh, real is not the right term, but people who did not expect to get the drug, but got the drug, will be sort of the 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 effect that is devoid of any placebo. Effect, right? Correct. And those, and those, should, wanted, those should be yeah. compared to those who got the placebo and thought that they got the placebo, right? And you want you want to match people for expectation and do your drug placebo comparison within that group for both groups. You can after you you've done that, you can you know you can put your data together. Yeah. I mean, the, I don't, uh, I don't know much about pharmaceuticals, but this sounds so intuitive to me. Why, why do you think, why, why do you think uh, they don't do it this way? Because they're very traditional, and you know, <laughs> the FDA says this is the trial that you need to show us, you know, a statistically significant effect of your drug, and if you do that, we approve it, right? 
And and you you know because you've been in the pharmaceutical industry that it's the pharmaceutical industry goes to what do they call clinical research organizations CROs, right? Yeah. And and that's what they do. Right, right. So we have templates and exactly. we use templates. And uh, this type of a trial also, Howard, might require more patients. So it has an impact on the cost side, I would imagine. Well, I would argue no, right? It, yeah. Not necessarily. I mean, if, if you say that what you're doing is reducing the variability, then yeah. you wouldn't need a big cohort. You could reduce the variability with the same number of patients, right? And you can pull your results from the two groups. That is true, yeah, and and like you said, um, it could also make some uh, trials turn out to be positive. That is marginal today. That is and right. Work, it might actually uh, actually show effect. Right, yeah. and it also it also could be. So here's a, here's another thing to possibly consider is that for those people who are expecting to have a drug effect their central yeah. nervous system is going to be operating differently from those who ex who think that they're getting the placebo, right? And mm. if you're saying, well, I've got a drug that's acting on the nervous system, the effect of the drug may depend on the state of the nervous system when the drug enters the brain, right? Yeah. So you could say, you know, uh, in the clinical situation in general, uh, so a doctor comes in, you know, they've got gray hair, they're wearing a white coat, uh, they have a nice voice, you know, they're friendly, they've taken their time, you know, to give you a thorough examination. And they say, hey, look, you know, here's this new drug. I've had a lot of good responses to it. Uh, I think this is really going to help you. Uh, yeah. And then you give the drug. And I'm saying that in the clinical situation, uh, you're going to have a bigger drug effect. And that's, that's why you need to, you know, show that expectation has this big effect. And then the other thing that I always tell all my, fr all my friends who are taking care of pain patients is you need to actually ask people what they expect is going to happen, you know, from your treatment, Right. Because a right. lot of times people will say, look, doc, I've tried everything, you know, nothing's worked, right? They're, they're coming to this referral center and I, and I'll say, well, do you think I can help you? They'll say, well, I hope so. No, I said, do you think I can help you? I said, well, I don't think so. <laughs> and then I say, well, why are you here? I said, well, yeah. because, you know, my uncle told me I absolutely had to come to UCSF. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that is what I, I, I have a bit of a worry, Harvard, that uh, going back to the clinical trial design, there could be some personality and behavior biases in those buckets. There have to be. You know that's true. <laughs> and so as I wondered if, if it uh, kind of bleeds into the statistical observations. I haven't really thought about it. but How uh, could it not? It has to, doesn't it? It it has to, I would think, yes. You know, so so you say, you know, some people are going to think that, you know, let's call them optimistic. They got the drug. They're going to have good effect. They're going to get over it. Some people are always going to say, going to think that they got the, got the sugar pill. Nothing is going to happen. Well, right? all, all I'm <laughs> saying is that you can reduce the variability within a yeah. population by matching people who have similar expectations, right? Yes, yeah. Now, the, the question would be, the, the way they are wired has any bias. Oh, sure. <laughs> That's true. That's a really good point. I, yeah. I would say yeah. yes to that. <laughs> and, and then, you, you know, go back to something you said earlier uh, in the segment is, you know, everybody's different. Everybody is uh, that. That I think you know, like you mentioned, um, you know, at some level you could standardize 
uh, but if if it is a wire, the wiring diagram itself has some biases, then then we will always find some type of people in those buckets, populating those buckets. And um, but 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 the the idea is is a is a good one, Howard. I mean, it's not just for pain; it's it's pretty much for any clinical trial, I would think. Well, right? I would say any clinical trial where your outcome is a subjective measure. Right. Yeah. So for depression, for anxiety, for pain, uh, for itch, you know, a lot of a lot of things there. I mean, when it's if you're using an objective measure. So, for example, let's say uh, you're looking at uh, breast cancer and you've got a new chemotherapy, you can do uh, imaging studies and show that your chemical actually reduces the size of the tumor over a period of time. That's, that has nothing to do with the patient's subjective experience. But don't we see placebo effects even there? Uh, that has not been possible to show. I, I hmm. looked for that intensively when we were doing this placebo research. And yeah. really, really, you the the effects of it, of placebos on objective measures mm. it's quite minimal there are some papers that show improvements in wound healing with experimental you know wounds yeah uh, but that's about it from from what i'd seen yeah so so maybe um Maybe it is something to do with the brain. So, you know, uh, if it is a CNS uh, type issue, there are decisions being made in the brain. There are different circuits involved and the brain is sort of modulating between the circuits. And so so, so you would think uh, maybe it is a CNS type issues where this could be. That's, if, if, that's where I put my money. Yeah. 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 And there's, there's evidence from functional imaging that, it is specific places in the CNS that are associated with, you know, placebo responding. Number one, you get a, a reduction in the neurological pain signature for any given intensity of pain. So that for sure happens. But then there's another set of circuits that we generally consider to be involved in the decision-making process. These are activated, uh, you know, and correlated with placebo responses. Right. Uh, I, I want to uh, conclude with your uh, paper on opioid. So it, it is entitled Understanding Opioid Reward. Uh, you say opioids are the most potent analgesic in, chem in clinical use. However, their powerful rewarding properties can lead to addiction. And the scientific challenge is to retain analgesic potency while limiting the development of tolerance, dependence, and addiction. Uh, do we have a way to do that? There are people that are looking into this uh, for a variety of measures. Uh, there do seem to be different uh, chemicals that are more or less safe. Uh, so uh, one of the more interesting uh, drugs that we have now. It's a drug called buprenorphine and it acts uh, at the mu receptor. It has some other actions at other receptors, uh, but it's what's called a partial agonist, uh, which turns out uh, to make it a safer opioid. So for example, for any degree of pain relief with buprenorphine, let's say compared to morphine, uh, it produces less respiratory depression. And it's respiratory depression is what makes opiates like morphine, like fentanyl, like oxycodone or oxycontin, heroin. Uh, that's what makes them dangerous. It's the respiratory depression. So it suggests that there may be a way to develop uh, new compounds that cause less respiratory depression. Now, in terms of whether there's a difference in how rewarding a drug is for any degree of, of pain relief, that's a more difficult challenge. There are drugs that are not opioids, uh, 
The most common, of course, is aspirin or uh, ibuprofen, right? Which, you know, some people call Advil or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and they, if, if you don't have pain, they're not rewarding, right? So nobody takes, you know, aspirin to get high, right? Uh, <laughs> but you could have a very bad headache and an aspirin will relieve that headache completely. So under certain circumstances, you have these drugs. So what that says is, at least in theory, you can dissociate pain relief from addiction. Yeah. Now, can we can we view addiction um, as related to this prediction the brain has? So, so if you sort of do this over time, you are conditioning. So the brain predicts an effect; it doesn't quite get it. Um, and so it wants more. That that is what's going on. It's not really satisfying its expectations. Yeah. Well, there's actually there are two parts to it, and this gets into yeah. how do you learn, for example, to associate things in the environment with either reward or pain, right? The way you, the way that happens is you do something, and if you feel good after you've done it then you're going to do it again. If you feel bad after you've done it, you're less likely to do it again. So that would be aversion, right? So we know that if you say inject an opioid, it's going to make you feel good. That's going to make you want to do it again, right? So over time with repeated self-administration of a drug, you learn, you know, that, you know, going to the dealer, buying the drug, getting uh, the hypodermic, injecting yourself. You go through all those motions, you get high, you feel good, so you're more likely to do it again. But there's another part uh, to it that's seen uh, with opiates, and that is if you're taking them regularly and you stop, you feel badly somehow you've changed the homeostatic settings of your brain so that if there's no opioid in your brain, you feel a craving, you feel that you need it, right? And that's called abstinence or withdrawal. And that in itself creates a motivational state that makes you want to have the drug. Very similar to being food deprived, feeling hungry, and that increases your motivation to go out and look for food, buy it, and take it home and eat it, right? So there's a motivational part. There's a learning part uh, to addiction. Both seem to, to a certain extent, to involve this reward pathway that somehow when you're in this abstinent state, your reward pathway is, is suppressed and it makes you feel the hunger, the craving. So it could be that some of the same circuits in your brain uh, that are acted upon by opioids are involved both in the learning and in the craving, both in the motivation and in the reward, you know, that you feel when you get the drug after you've craved it. Mm. And the and the tolerance aspect of it, Howard. So alcohol yes. tolerance, for example, uh, is it is it because the circuits are getting less sensitive? Uh, so the utility that you expected with the dose, you you don't quite get it. So you yeah, have to increase that's the dose. Correct. Uh, that it, that's partly related to it, but tolerance also has an independent component to it, and the general feeling. Yeah now is that there's uh, one of the major mechanisms for tolerance is an uncoupling between the binding event of, let's say, morphine to the mu receptor. You get a certain amount of binding of the drug to the receptor, but the receptor signals less in the cell, right? So there's a, a uncoupling of the drug from the cellular effect of the drug. Uh, that mm. is basic, that, that's what you would call tolerance, pure and simple. Same drug, less effect. 
dependence uh, is somewhat different. Dependence is defined as an unpleasant state that occurs after you've had the drug, right? And then you stop, yeah. right? That, for example, you know, you would never get a withdrawal state from an individual who'd never been on an opioid. It just doesn't happen. You have to be on it, on it for a certain period of time and at a certain dose. The higher the dose, the longer you've been on it, the more severe the craving and the abstinence effect, which can be literally painful. When you when you stop taking an opioid, it isn't that the effect just goes away, it's that you feel terrible. And part of part of that feeling is actual aches and pains in your body. It's like a bad flu. Yeah, it it is uh, it has become a big problem. So so Howard, in conclusion, you have done so much work in this area of pain. Um, as you look forward next five years, where do you think uh, where do you think we could make additional discoveries, uh, innovation? Uh, where is most likely that we will? Be able oh, there's so many places. I mean, n- number one, we need to have better understanding of the how the peripheral nervous system senses tissue damage. There's a lot of work being done on that in many labs. What is it about injuring a nerve that makes it become painful? How does it start generating uh, new pain signals where there weren't signals before? So there's what I would say, there's many projects going on to help us understand the disease process in the body. There's another, you know, completely separate field of what are the changes that occur in the central nervous system when there's persistent pain, right? So the big problem is not how do you treat acute pain? We're very good at that. You know, people, there's, you know, millions of people are having surgery every day it's painless because you're anesthetized and postoperatively we can control your pain through a variety of methods. So I would say acute pain, we're good at that. Chronic pain is really the problem. And there's general consensus that this occurs through changes in the central nervous system due to a persistent painful input, right? So what are those? Hmm. Uh, gen- now there's no general general agreement, but there are multiple independent lines. People are looking at the spinal cord. They're looking at the, the peripheral nervous system. They're looking in the central nervous system. Um, the thing that's most interesting to me is, you know, what's the circuitry for expectation? And are there ways that we can intervene in the central nervous system to tap into those circuits that either facilitate or inhibit pain. I expect to see a lot of progress along those lines. And finally, I think we're gonna be able to do a much better job uh, designing pain relievers that precisely target the pain suppression mechanisms in the brain or the pain amplification systems in the brain. Right. There's already preliminary evidence that, you know, there are modifications of the receptor. Uh, These can be targeted, uh, you know, using, uh, you know, I would say almost uh, you'd have to use supercomputers because we have the we have the crystal (laughs) structure of these opioid receptors. We can use our understanding of that structure to determine which of the the current drugs that we have are the best and how can we improve on them, which by using pharmaceutical chemistry. So I would say a combination of, you know, uh, crystal structure, computational chemistry, medicinal chemistry, pharmaceutical chemistry, uh, and clinical observation uh, make me very optimistic that over the next decade or two, we're going to have some much better ways to treat our, our patients with both acute and chronic pain. 
Yeah, uh, just a quick question also, Howard. So do you think, do you think we get closer to sort of simulating what is happening in the brain or the whole CNS uh, system uh, uh, in silicon somehow so that you can, you know, chronic pain <laughs> without knowing anything about it. It's almost like a stuck yeah, switch, well, yeah. right? <laughs> it, it seems like- That's, keeps a, that's a great signals. question. And my, I, I generally tend to be an optimist, but I would say that yeah. so far uh, we haven't had the, the I would say the theoretical uh, aspect, uh, the computational aspect for for brain function, uh, we really don't yet understand fully how information is represented in the in the nervous system. We know about cells, we know about synapses, uh, we can record from lots of different cells, but it's a huge computational problem. You'd have to record from thousands of cells at multiple sites in the brain, we're starting to approach that. Then we have to sort of come up with some theoretical concepts about how the information is represented, you know, in the inhibitions and excitations at the different stages uh, of these of the circuit function. Oh, we'll get there, uh, but we're not there yet, and. Uh, what I would say is we need a, a stronger theoretical uh, approach to information processing in the brain. We've got the chemistry, we've got the anatomy, uh, we've got the tools to manipulate the brain, but we need some better ideas if we're going to understand how it works. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I sometimes uh, say that God <laughs> has a sense of humor. Yeah. I, I can't remember, but some famous scientist said, I think it was a physicist, that it might have been a physicist who turned into a neuroscientist. He said, you know, if, 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 if we were smart enough to understand the brain, the brain would be too complicated for us to understand it. <laughs> That's right. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great. It was Robert. a lot of Thanks fun, so Gil. Thanks for time with me. Bye-bye. Thank you. This is a Scientific Sense podcast providing unscripted conversations with leading academics and researchers on a variety of topics. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please reach out to info at scientificsense.com.